Did you see the, the PowerPoint again? Mm -hmm. So negative feedback. So you know insulin lowers blood sugar, right? So when your blood sugar goes too high, insulin is released by your pancreas, and then that makes your blood sugar go down. That's an example of, and, and your, your insulin is gonna be released until your blood sugar gets to a normal level, and then insulin will stop. That's negative feedback. Like once the problem's solved, your body shuts it off. So insulin gets shut down once your blood sugar gets to a normal level. That's an example of negative feedback. Right? You're trying to cancel out the negative thing. Right? If you so the negative thing is that your blood sugar is going too high, and so you know insulin's going to be released. That makes it go low. Then the insulin gets stopped. And the levels normal. So you're trying to cancel out what was negative. And then once you achieve that, then that's it. So you hear about negative feedback a few times. Not so much for our test. Um, let me just kind of skip it. All right. So there's certain vitamins and minerals that I want you to know about. And I want you to just have a rough about them. So here you see here you see water soluble vitamins. So there's six vitamins that I that I want you to know about. And um, here there's two. Right, so what you're looking at is all, all of these, we're gonna class all of these together, all except this last one. These are all B vitamins. So there's like eight different B vitamins, right? If you're a nutrition, you have to know what they do, but if you're here for biology, I just wanna tell you, like give you one thing about all these vitamins together. So we're gonna call all of these vitamins B vitamins. And they all, this is what they do, because well, I'm generalizing here. I'm making a big generalization about B vitamins. B vitamins help your body use energy. That's it, that's what they do. They help your body use energy. I made a big generalization, but you know. And if you notice, up here, like, look, there's FAD, there's NAD, there's coenzyme A that's going to be used for like acetyl-CoA. So all these vitamins are getting used, or most of them are getting used in the um, cellular respiration. You know, like the Krebs cycle and all that. But for now, we're just going to generalize. B vitamins help your body use energy. Done. Do you want us to know what's listed on their B vitamins? No. You don't even have to know the different B vitamins. Okay. Just in general, B vitamins. So if I were to say, tell me about the vitamins, then you're going to start by saying, B vitamins help your body use energy. That's it. And C, for C, we're going to put, you can put one of two things. Antioxidant. So if you see... Down here, it's saying antioxidant, or you can say used to make used to make collagen. Yeah, remember collagen is one of those fibers from uh, connective tissue. Talked about collagen fibers. Elastic fibers, particular fibers, and then collagen. I was telling you that collagen gives like strength to things. Um, so, collagen is like used in your bones to make bone, to make cartilage. So, um, so either one. You could say it's an antioxidant, 
or you can say it's used to make collagen. It does both. So uh, B vitamins and C vitamins are water soluble, meaning that they break down in water. So you need what you need B vitamin, vitamin B and C. You need those every day or two days. But you need them more often. But you also urinate them out more often. And then just one more time for everyone, we're taking all these B vitamins up here, all eight of them, and I just, I, I lump, I'm lumping them all together, just, just for biology. <clears throat> these are, these are the four lipid or fat soluble vitamins. So there's a total of six of vitamins. There's vitamins B and C, and then there's these four. Now we got six. A, D, E, K. So there's six vitamins. These are all lipid soluble, which means they're stored in your fat. So you don't need them every day. You're not peeing them out. They're staying in your body. Vitamin A can stay in your body for a year, even up to two years. So you do not need vitamin A all the time. So I'm just going to give you a word or two words about each vitamin. You probably already know these. So A, eyes, right? Eyesight, eyes, whatever. C, however you want to write. Obviously, it does more than just that, but I'm just giving you one thing. So A for eyes. D, you're thinking bones. Yes, D for bones. So on the test, you could just put bones good enough. Keep in mind, what it's really doing is vitamin D is related to calcium. So vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. The more D you have, the more calcium you have in your body. So they're always together. If you that. So D for bones, E, antioxidant. Just like vitamin C. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. Vitamin D is for bones. Yeah. Can you get vitamin D from? Yeah. So your skin can make it. Maybe not so much your skin, but you're gonna look young the whole life. So you can always take vitamin D pills. You can't take young looking pills. You can't take face cracking pills. Wait, hold on. So. I'll take the tray. But you live in the south, so you get more sun. People that live in the north, it's cold. So, you know, the vitamin D is not like so much of an issue in a place like New Orleans, but if you go up to like Boston, like, they're not outside and has nearly as much as we are, so it's, it's, it's an issue. So yeah, your skin can make it as long as you have sunlight. Uh, vitamin E is an antioxidant. Vitamin K is for blood clotting. There you go. So antioxidant, when you hear that word, not that you need to know this for the test, but I'm just giving you like a FYI. They're oxygen atoms that are missing their electrons. So they're like oxygen with a plus sign. And when that happens to oxygen, oxygen gets all pissed off. And as it is written down here. Can you just say damaged lipid? What's that? Damaged lipid. Yeah. So they damage your DNA 
and they damage your phospholipid membrane of your cell. So what an antioxidant will do is it'll give, so these oxygens that are missing their electrons, they're called free radicals. So uh, um, antioxidants give them an electron back, calm them down, and make them regular oxygen. So that's it. Free radicals are oxygens without electrons. They cause a lot of damage when they're like that. And then uh, vitamin C and vitamin E gives these free radicals and electrons and makes them regular oxygen. So vitamin K blood clot. So A for eyes, D for bone, E antioxidant, K clot. That's it. That's all you have to know. One word for each. And I want you to know that these four are lipid soluble or, or fat soluble, however you want to say it. There are different things that we're trying to get when we eat food. I keep popping in. <laughs> it's not that I'm ignoring you guys, I'm just... Nika, look, I'm just gonna... And then I'm facing away from you because I feel like if I have the mask, it's muddled. So then I want to pull it down so I can talk into that, but then I don't want to face you. Alright. So, um... So you, there's different things that your body needs, because we're talking about the digestive system, so what does your body get from food? We're getting vitamins, we're also getting minerals. So vitamins, minerals, and then we're getting energy. Energy comes from carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, right? So that's energy. Vitamins don't have any energy, and neither do um, minerals. There's no energy from that. Hmm? They, um, they're just for body maintenance. So like an energy drink, those energy drinks don't actually have energy, unless there's sugar in them. But like the energy shots and stuff, they, they often, they're using not, they're not, they're not using real sugar, they're using, um, I don't know, whatever they're using, sucralose or something. It's like a low, low, um, like a syrup. They put in it, but it's like a little sugar. A little bit, that could have If it doesn't have any calories, it doesn't have any energy, but like period. So if you look at some of those energy drinks that have like two calories or five calories, that's no energy, so that's not. It's caffeine. It's caffeine, and it's like derivatives of caffeine. And that's what it is. There's stimulants in energy drinks. Can I ask you this? What, what causes by drinking an energy drink to make you water? The caffeine. caffeine. Yeah. So it's called it's like caffeine, and then there's something close to a called taurine. And um, it's like another stimulant that they put in there. So they put in caffeine and the like caffeine's close cousins. So and then um, vitamin niacin, this B vitamin niacin, if you take niacin in kind of like a high amount. It makes you feel like you're on ADHD meds. So that's like that illusion that you're concentrating, like that little buzzing in your ear, like just that, that's nice. You gotta be careful, because like, look here where it says like, um, too much, and it's like nice and flush. So if you take too much energy drink, so if you have too much niacin, it'll, uh, it's not gonna kill you, it just makes you, uh, it's like all your body fell asleep. You know how it tingles when your arm falls asleep? It's like that, right? Yeah. For like a couple hours, for your whole body. I had that happen to me the other day. <laughs> so you got a total of six vitamins, and you have some minerals. I don't want you to know all these minerals, right? There's a lot, so don't worry about it. If you take nutrition, then you learn this, but not here. I want you to know maybe three. Let's do three. Three that I know you're going to run into next semester. 
like in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to do calcium, potassium, and sodium. Those three. Do you notice the sodium is Na, and they we always use the abbreviations. So sodium is Na, potassium is K, calcium is Ca. All of these minerals are ions, like they're all charged. They're not putting what charge it has, and that's fine. But all the ones I told you are positively charged. So potassium, calcium, sodium, they're all positive. Some of these are negative, like, like, um, like fluorine and, and um, iodine, whatever. Right. So right now, the main ones, calcium, potassium, and sodium. And I'm going to talk about them all together. So I'm kind of generalizing here. So sodium, potassium, calcium are responsible for any electrical impulse in your body. These three are going to be making that happen. So if you think about like the nerves firing in your body, it's sodium, potassium, calcium. All your muscles moving, there's electrical signals going through your muscles. And especially your heart. Your heart's a big muscle. So this also you know, when you're looking at like an EKG and you see all the electrical things, that's these, that's these minerals. They're making your heart beat. They're initiating that. We call it an action potential. They're making that action potential happen. So, for instance, say you put that on the test, how would you want us to work that? So I'll ask you just what is the function of, um, these are electrolytes, right? They're minerals, but the ones I gave you are also, we also call them electrolytes. So I can say like, what are the, tell me the function of three electrolytes, or tell me the function of three minerals, right? And then you just say sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium. They, uh, they regulate or they cause your heartbeat and they cause your electrical signals in your muscles. I mean, however you want to write it. Just something so I know that you know about the electrical signals in your body. <clears throat> they make your nerves fire. They make your heart fire. Any way that you write it is fine. Okay. So all the ions have their charge and electrolytes? Yes, these are called electrolytes. <clears throat> the, the, the upper half, when you look from calcium to magnesium, these are all electrolytes. They're major minerals, we have them call them electrolytes. And then all of these down here are, we call them, starting with iron all the way down, we call them trace minerals. It just means, do we need them in large amounts or we, do we use them in small amounts? They're all important. It's just that from magnesium up to calcium, we use those in bigger quantities. But I just picked three. Sodium, and just think in your head, sodium, potassium, sodium, potassium, they're always together. And then, and then calcium kind of comes in, calcium's kind of like a neighbor. But sodium and potassium, they're always doing stuff together. Sodium and potassium is a married couple, and calcium's a neighbor. So calcium will come to a cell and visit and then leave. Sodium and potassium, they work together, like a married couple, they work together to do things, but they don't like to be in the same room together. So whenever sodium enters a cell, potassium leaves. And then when sodium leaves the cell, potassium comes back in. They're always swapping places. They love each other, they're just, they're just done. They don't want to hear about, sodium doesn't want to hear about potassium today. Potassium's always fighting with Trish. It's like every day. Quit your job. Go move departments. Stop talking about Trish. I just made all that up. Uh, 
but they make your you're going to hear about those three next semester when you learn about how muscles how muscles move so that's it i'll say one more thing for sodium water because we talked about this water follows so sodium sodium is one of the solutes that water follows it around so that if you pee out sodium you're going to pee out water if you keep sodium you're going to keep water so that's kind of a thing that comes like an idea that's going to keep coming back in other classes that's right? so water follows sodium Half, half, half of people that are over 40 are on some kind of water pill. I'm not, it's not half, but a lot, right? Your body builds up too much water, and it's not really expensive. It's making them high because their blood pressure Yeah, my mom had <laughs> So the, the, the water pills, if you wanted to call it a better name, we could call them sodium pills. They like make you, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them make you, make you get rid of sodium and then by that, you're getting rid of water, and you have less blood in your body, and that makes your blood pressure go. So, okay, so three minerals, six vitamins, then of course we have the energy, carbs, lipids, and proteins. I'm going to skip all this, I'm going to go right to the human digestive system. So there it is. There's two, there's two parts, there's two parts to this. One is a, is a tube. That tube starts with your mouth and it ends with your anus. So it starts here and it's ending down here. So it's your mouth and then the food goes in, you know, the food goes in your mouth, you chew it. Food goes into your esophagus. And that's taking the food to your stomach. The esophagus doesn't have really any kind of function. It's just that up in your chest, you've got the heart and lungs. So we got to get the food from our mouth down to our stomach. So that's it's, it's like a hallway. So that's all. We're just trying to get the food down to our stomach. So you eat the food. Food goes down the esophagus, food goes into the stomach. So you notice how the stomach obviously looks different than the esophagus. It's the same tube. We consider it the same tube. It's just the stomach is it's been stretched out. And then for the stomach, the food's going to go into the small intestine. So all this here is small intestine. So it's just a continuation of the stomach. The small intestine. Then the large intestine. See how it comes up? Those, so they call it the colon. So that the, the large intestine obviously looks different from the small intestine, which looks different from the stomach, but it's all one continuous tube. So much so that if you were to swallow a penny, and you poo it out the other end, we don't consider that something they got in your body. Because we don't consider this like in your body. Because <clears throat> it's it's in a tube. You dropped it in one end and it came out the other end. It never entered your blood. It never, you know. Same thing with like pathogens. So we we, we treat <clears throat> we treat pathogens differently depending on if they get in your body or not. So if bacteria lands on your skin, we say, well, that's that didn't get in the body, right? But if you were to eat a piece of bacteria and swallow it and went into your stomach, and then the acid in your stomach just killed the bacteria, we say, oh, it didn't get in the body. <clears throat> so it goes all the way through. So we call this the GI tract. You've probably heard of that word GI. And GI stands for gastro, gastrointestinal. When you hear the word gastro, you think of stomach. Intestine, intestine. You think tract? Tract.
They also call it a canal, alimentary canal. But the GI tract, so GI. <clears throat> and then when you see people that don't have problems with like their heart, that'll be the main thing that people have problems with, like heart, um, something with blood vessels, something with blood pressure, something with heart. After that, you'll find GI problems. So when they're saying GI, they're talking about this gastrointestinal tract, like a GI bleed, right? And then you say, well, where's the bleed? Is it an upper GI or is it a lower GI? So what they're saying is like, where is it in here? Is it like in the esophagus or is it in the stomach or is the bleed in the intestine? In the intestine you know, in different places. So let's talk about the function. All right, so wait, before we do the functions, this is the GI tract. Esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum. That's the GI tract. Then you have things called accessory organs. They help with digestion, but they're not part of this tube. You have up in your mouth your teeth and your tongue and your saliva, your salivary gland. I'm not going to really go over any of those three because you got that'll be an EV too. But you know, that's those are accessory glands. Your teeth are accessory glands. It's not part of that too, but obviously you need your teeth to grind that food. And you need your saliva to like mix to make the food moist. You need your tongue to push the food back and get it down your, your esophagus. And then down here in the abdomen, so in the abdomen, you feel your the bottom of your chest plate, your sternum. Everything below your sternum, your chest plate, everything below that is abdomen. Well, that area below it is abdomen, and then the area above it, your chest area, we call it thorax. That's just FYI. I'm trying to give you words you're going to have like in another two weeks. So this is, this is all the thorax. So anyway, I'm at the, I'm at the, I'm in the abdomen here, and there's three organs here. Uh, liver, and then you see that green gallbladder, and then there's a yellow pancreas, and it looks like it's behind, like underneath, behind the stomach. And that's really where it is. Like if you, if you, we're looking at a cadaver, you have to lift the stomach, and then you see the, the pancreas underneath. It looks exactly like that meat that they put in pho, like that flank steak. That's what it looks like, to me at least. Or sometimes it looks like a brain. It's like, what's this? It's the same, it looks, it's got that, I don't know, you look just have to see it. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, I'm not eating that again. <laughs> We can't look at anything because we're not in lab, but usually we dissect at least a cat. But we, oh, God. But we can't, can't do that. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, we can't biology. We dissect a field of right? And so, we can't see it this semester. So those are accessory organs. And we'll talk about those in a few more slides. But let's talk about the, um, the functions of the GI tract. Your esophagus, no function. I don't really care if you know anything about it. Just a hallway, right? You just want to get the food past the thorax and into the abdomen. That's it. But the stomach does have a function. And it's not like, you know, digestion. What is digestion? So, um, two types of digestion. There's, there's a physical digestion and then there's a chemical digestion. Because if you're drinking like uh, like an energy, like if you're drinking like Insure or some kind of like replacement meal drink, Slim Fast, something like that, that's already physically broken down, right? It's liquid. So you don't need to digest that physically any more than you have. But the molecules are too big. 
the fat that's in that drink, the, the fat drops are too big, and the sugars are too big. Even though it's liquid, it doesn't matter. It's still too big. It won't go into your blood. Your body has to make all the molecules smaller so that we can ultimately absorb it in your blood. So the stomach is going to physically break food down. So the stomach is going to turn your food into, it's going to liquefy your food. So what's the function of the stomach? Liquefy your food. So the stomach liquefies your food. The small intestine, which is next, stomach liquefies your food. The small intestine is going to absorb all the vitamins and minerals and energy. This is where all this stuff enters your bloodstream. For example, if you if you eat a candy bar, this is where the sugar from the candy bar starts to enter your blood, in the small intestine. So the, the main function of the small intestine, absorption. Then the food goes into the large intestine. The large intestine is going to take water back, reclaim water. Because this, this food is liquid. It's going to be leaving the body, so you don't want to lose that water. <clears throat> so pretend you just ate a box of goldfish crackers, right? And you're not drinking any water. Right, so that's all dry, or, or dry bread, or you're eating a bag of croutons. I don't know why you do it, but it's all dry, right? But your stomach is going to liquefy those croutons. So to do that, your body has to donate water to liquefy those croutons. So you, you bought, your, your stomach is borrowing water from other parts of your body to liquefy the food. You need that water back. You gotta liquefy it because we gotta get all the we gotta suck all the nutrients out. So you gotta liquefy it. You can't leave it solid. But now in the small intestine, we've taken all the nutrients out, and so now before it goes into the toilet, we want that water back as much as we can. And when that doesn't happen, it's obviously it's like it's diarrhea. That's diarrhea, like the food just goes through your large intestine really quick. Because your body, what happens is that your body sends a pathogen, like maybe you got food poisoning, right? And then ideally, you'll sense it in your stomach and you throw it up. But sometimes it's too late and it, and it moves on past the stomach, but then in the intestines, your body's like, oh, I see that pathogen, I see that bacteria. Let's just, you know what, let's not absorb anything from this. We're just going to send it on its way. Get rid of it. So it's still liquefying. Okay. So what's the problem with, with diarrhea? Actually, the first problem before anything else, dehydration. Especially in younger people. Like that's the first thing you think about. You're not like, oh, they're sick. Are they going to get a fever? No. Dehydration. Are they dehydrated? This is a huge killer of kids in the world. They, they just they dry up. Not in America, but in other places, they just dry up. They just have diarrhea. It doesn't stop. And then... They drink water, but their body starts, you know, then the body's like, oh, I, I'm i catching on to what's going on. I'm sick. So you drink water, you just throw it up. And you keep the diarrhea going. 
And so then that's what you just dry up. And so, um, I don't know what my point is. That's the point. That's the purpose of the large intestine. The large intestine is going to take that about eighty to ninety percent of the water. If it takes too much back, you know what happens. If it stays in there for too long, that's constipation. People on. I'm just giving you kind of an example here. People that take opioids, like in a hospital, let's say and they were in an accident, whatever, and so they put them on Percocet or something, right? That's, that is a, we call this parasympathetic. It takes care of them. It's, it, it does the opposite of your fight or flight. It slows everything down. So it slows down muscles, right? It, it can slow down breathing, but it also slows down your intestines. So that's like one of the things why they, like get constipated so much because their large intestine is not, the muscles inside the large intestine are not moving. And so the food's not moving through there fast enough, actually. It's going too slow. And the longer it's in there, the more water gets absorbed. And then now you can't get that. I don't know why. I Let's go through. I'm trying. I'm trying to. All right, here's the esophagus. <clears throat> you eat the food. We're going to call this food a bolus. You see the word right here. B O L U S. A bolus is just a mass of something. In the hospital, sometimes they call like an IV, they'll call that a bolus. It just means a mass. Here, we're talking about food. So the Bolus is chewed up food. You swallow, you eat food and you swallow a bolus. So you notice here, they've got these words. They're calling it the esophageal sphincter. I'm not actually concerned about that one. The one that I want you to, that I want to tell you about is not even labeled here. So, you have these sphincters throughout your gastrointestinal tract. And I'm only going to want you to know, I'm going to want you to know maybe three of them. Sphincter? To bring a muscle? No, I was trying to figure out, because I'm not organized part of time, so I'm probably just trying to see what you put it on there. Okay, I'm going to put it at the end of the, so in between the esophagus, here's the end of the esophagus, and here's the end of the stomach. We call this a cardiac, like it's in heart, cardiac sphincter. They got this food going right through it, so you can't see it. Let me see if I get a better picture. Maybe if you could see this one. So right here, See where I've got like above the hand? That's the cardiac sphincter. This is the esophagus up here. Here's the stomach. This is a cardiac sphincter. It's just like a, it looks like a, you're looking at like a, well, you know what? It looks like an anal sphincter. Same thing. The ring of muscles. The anal sphincter is like the last one you have in your body, which I'm not going to test you on. But the first one that, I want you to know about is called the cardiac sphincter. It's not related to the heart, actually. They call this part of the stomach right here at the top, they call it the cardia. And you don't have to, you do not have to know that. But I do want you to know this is called the cardiac sphincter. Sometimes they call it lower esophageal sphincter. I see that in the book. Just call it cardiac. Everyone calls it cardiac. So what its function is, is it opens up to let the food go into the stomach. Once the food goes into the stomach, you do not want it going back in, back up through the esophagus. Once the food leaves the esophagus, it's out. <clears throat> Okay, 
This is what happened to the heartburn. Because the stomach is super acidic. But that's okay. The stomach has a thick layer of mucus that, that lines the walls. So the epithelial tissue, to use the words now, the epithelial tissue in the stomach is protected by mucus. So the acid does not burn the epithelial tissue. Unless you get an ulcer. That's what an ulcer is. If the, if the mucus wears away, you'll have a peptic ulcer. Because then the acid is touching your epithelial cells, your epithelial tissue. It starts burning a hole in your stomach. But what happens more often is that this cardiac sphincter doesn't work like it should, and acid gets back up into the esophagus. Esophagus doesn't have any, it doesn't have any mucus to protect it. So you feel it. That's what the heart is, or bird, or whatever, reflex, whatever you want to call it. The cardiac sphincters fail, and there's different reasons for it. One reason is just that you're getting old. But there's neurological reasons and stuff like that. So, the food goes into the stomach. It goes past the cardiac sphincter and into the stomach. The function of the stomach liquefies the food. I just want to see if I have a better slide. So, Here's a possible question that, I'll, that I would ask you this time. What is the function of the stomach? And what are the features of the stomach that allow it to do its function? So I'll explain that again. What's the function of the stomach? You know, what does it do? Stomach liquefies your food. Okay, what's so special about the stomach? that it liquefies your food and not some other part of your body. So we say in anatomy that form fits function. The shape of the stomach, the features of the stomach, allow it to break down your food. So our body parts have features that allow it to do whatever its job is. That's the job of the stomach, break down, liquefy your food. <clears throat> what are the features? You know, how is the stomach adapted for this? One, it makes acid. You see here, they're calling it H. Here in red, it says HCL. That just stands for hydrochloric acid. And you're welcome to put HCL if you want. I would just like you to know in your head what it means. Hydrochloric acid. Hydrogen and chlorine. That's all that the HCL is, right? One atom of hydrogen, one atom of chlorine. You remember stuff from class. Chlorine is an electron stealer. It's going to steal hydrogen's electron. That means the hydrogen is going to be left without its electron. And it's an H plus. In other words, it's a proton. That makes things acidic. If you don't remember it, it's okay. Just we learned all that. All right, so how does the stomach liquefy food? Number one, it makes hydrochloric acid. Two, when you look at the whole gastrointestinal tract, well, you have the lining. Let's start with the lining. What kind of tissue is the lining of the stomach? This is your time to say the word that's going to be on quiz four that I talked about last class. As soon as you hear the word lining, you have your answer. There's four different types of tissue. Even a letter, the one that starts with an E. Good. So it's epithelial tissue. That's the lining of the stomach. The E is good enough. So you'll get the word, you keep hearing the word, it will stick. So 
Epithelial tissue, for example, up here on this photo, look at all these cells. These are epithelial cells. In fact, it's kind of like difficult to make out the shape of it. But if you were to have to guess, squamous, hemoidal, columnar, what do they look more like? You have to pick one. It's just a guess. Cuboidal? Huh? Cuboidal? It's a good guess. Because they do kind of look like like these down here, like that these are cubes, right? Like these look like cube. Like that's a definite cube. So they're columnar. No, it's not on you guys. It's you know, how, that's what I mean. Like this this these epithelial cells, they it's hard to tell sometimes like what they are. We know for sure it's not spraying, they're not flat. That's definite. Just what are they after that? It's okay. I mean, no one's ever going to really. <clears throat> I think it'd be unfair for any of your teachers to like try to do that to you. I never would. But I do want you to know it's epithelial tissue. And then I want you to know what's going to be underneath of this. So in the stomach, you have the lining, which is epithelial tissue. Underneath that, you have muscle. So what kind of muscle? There's three types of muscle in your body. So what type do you find in the organs? That's on quiz four. Yeah. All right, so here, let's narrow it down. I'll tell you the three types of muscle. Skeletal, cardiac, smooth. Cardiac means heart. This is not the heart. That's an easy process of elimination. Now you just ask yourself, is this attached to bone, yes or no? It's your stomach. There's no bone. It's not attached to any bone. There you go, smooth. Smooth muscles in your organs. Your whole GI tract has smooth muscle. Esophagus, stomach, intestine, all of it has muscle. In fact, there's two layers of muscle. The GI tract. I'm going back here to the esophagus. That'd be nice if they had more. So there's a layer of muscle running up and down the esophagus, and we call this longitudinal. I don't. I don't really think I care. They you know that now. But there's a layer of muscle that's running up and down. And then there's another layer of muscle that's circling around it, which we call circular. So same thing with the stomach. There's a layer of muscle running long ways in the stomach. We call that longitudinal. And then there's a layer of muscle circling around the stomach. And we call that circular. The stomach has a third layer of muscle, which we call a diagonal or oblique, whatever word you want. So there's three, this is the second thing. The stomach has three layers of muscle. Because the stomach is beating the shit out of this, well, that's not even a good word to use. It's manhandling, probably not a good word to use either. But I'm going to use it anyway, because I can't think of another word. It's, it's manhandling your food. Um. Overpowering. It's overpowering any of these words of treatment. It's not being nice. It's pushing this food around. Right? So the food drops into the stomach. There's three layers of muscle all pushing on this food. And it's in acid. So that's physically breaking the food up. So let's go back to the test question. What is the function of the stomach? Liquefy food. How is the stomach adapted to perform that function? 
and like what is it about the stomach that lets it break down food? It it's got three layers of muscle, and it makes acid. And that's good enough. So would that be listed on the what's the feature? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, what are the features of the stomach? One, it can make acid. Two, it's got an extra layer of muscle. And what about the lining tissue? Yeah. No. I, I was just trying to bring oh, okay. information from this four into this chapter. So I want to pound that word epithelial. I want you to have an idea about, about tissues. Right? The stomach is a layer of epithelial tissue. And then underneath that epithelial tissue, underneath that, you have um, you have muscle. And under that, you have a thin layer of elastin, which we consider that connective tissue. And then the outside of the stomach is all connective tissue. So it's like epithelial, muscle, connective. Obviously, there's nerves in your stomach because your stomach moves. So there's nervous tissue in your stomach, too. We didn't talk about that. But when you feel hungry, like, you, like your stomach is growling, that's your smooth muscle contracting. But there's no food. When there's food in your stomach and your, and your stomach muscles contract, you don't feel it. When it's empty, then you feel it. That's your stomach growling. So, notice the stomach up here, you have this cardiac sphincter, that is to prevent food from going back into the esophagus. This sphincter here is called the pyloric sphincter. It's, it's not about preventing backflow, it's to slow down food from going into the intestine. You don't want to dump food from your stomach into your small intestine. Show you another view. This is your stomach. Here's your cardiac sphincter, right about here, where my pointer is. And then this is the beginning of your small intestine. You don't want to dump food from here to here. Same problem. It's acidic. Just like your esophagus cannot handle the acid, your small intestine cannot handle the acid. So you don't want to dump acid into your small intestine. Just give it a little bit at a time, like half of a teaspoon. That's about how much food goes into your small intestine at a time. <coughs> so your stomach's going to hold that food for a while and let it go little by little. My large sphincter is going to open up. Oh, right here. Oh, so check this out. This picture right here has like a little. Here's your cardiac sphincter, and there's your pyloric sphincter. This right here is smooth muscle. But anyway. So the pyloric sphincter, you don't want to dump food into the small intestine. And what is the function of the small intestine? It is the muscle pack. That's the stomach. So now the food goes into the small intestine. Absorption. Absorption. The small intestine is where things get absorbed. So you don't want to dump everything into the small intestine at one time. The small intestine needs to absorb all of that goodness out of your food. You don't want to just dump it all in there. It doesn't have time to do its job. So. It's, it's acidic, so you don't want to let a little through because it's acidic. Number two, you need to give the small intestine time to do its job. You'll learn about this in AP too, but there's a battle going on between the stomach and the small intestine. The stomach keeps trying to open this pyloric sphincter up because it's getting filled up with food and it, it wants to get rid of it, so it keeps trying to open this pyloric sphincter up. Small intestine keeps trying to close it because it doesn't want all that acid and stuff. They don't control the sphincter themselves. Obviously, the brain controls it, 
So they keep sending up signals to the brain. It's like competing brother and sister complaining to the parent. Hey, tell her to stop. Tell her to stop. And they're each telling the brain, open me up. The other one's saying, no, close it. When you drink coffee, you, you're allowing the stomach to have an upper hand, and it will tell the, the brain to open this pylorx speaker up. So like coffee makes you have to go to the bathroom. It, it's, well, you'll learn about it later. But it's essentially, it's opening this pylorx speaker more than it should be. So the food is going to move into the intestine now. So <clears throat> here's the stomach in brown. Here's the beginning of the small intestine in pink. You do not have to learn this word duodenum or duodenum yet. This semester, will though, I promise you, but not now. So here's the small intestine in pink. So look at this other stuff. Look at these three accessory organs. Notice that there, there's tubes. They're small, not tubes, they're ducts. They're ducts. There's ducts running to the small intestine. There's one running from the liver, there's one running from the gallbladder, and there's one running from the pancreas, all into the small intestine. <clears throat> so, the small intestine, its job is to absorb nutrients from your food and, and energy. Right? It's got a second job too. Chemical breakdown. Right? Your stomach liquefied your food. Your, your stomach physically broke down your food. But we still got to make those molecules small enough so that it can get into your blood. The sugar is too big, like liquid starch won't go into your blood, it's too big. If you were to just drink olive oil, the molecules of oil, like the drops of, of fat of oil, it's too big, it won't, get into your, it, it won't get into your body. If you don't do something with it, with an enzyme, it's just going to pass right through you. So, you gotta put some enzymes in here to make these molecules small enough to get into your bloodstream. So that's what the pancreas is gonna do. The pancreas makes a bunch of enzymes that break down, that break your liquid food small enough. Like a protein, we wanna turn proteins into amino acids. So when you drink a protein drink, it's already liquid, yes. So your stomach's not having to do any work with it. But it's that protein won't go into your bloodstream. You have to break it all up into amino acids. And that's what the pancreas is going to do. The pancreas is making enzymes, and the enzymes are going to go down this tube, and the enzymes are going to break up the protein. <coughs> I'm going to go another eight minutes. And wherever I'm at at that point, I'm going to stop. The pancreas also makes something called sodium bicarbonate. It's, in other words, it's baking soda. That's what baking soda is. Baking soda is like Arm & Hammer, your refrigerator. Well, I don't know why it's in your refrigerator. It's like it's been in there for four years. Like a block of baking soda, it's all nasty to take it out. It's supposed to uh, eliminate the odors out of the But we all like put it in there and we just forget about it. Yeah. It's all the way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a, but you know, baking soda is an antacid. So if you ever have heartburn, you don't have any tongues or something, you can use baking soda. <laughs> so baking soda raises the pH, it makes things less acidic. Raising the pH means less acidic. Your pancreas makes the same thing, bicarbonate. You hear about bicarbonate a lot when you get into physiology. 
<coughs> so your pancreas makes bicarbonate. So here comes the acid from the stomach. Here comes bicarbonate from the pancreas. It's going to meet the acid and it's going to neutralize it. So your pancreas makes two things, digestive enzymes and antacid bicarbonate. That's your pancreas. If you look up here at your liver and gallbladder, they're both saying bile. Bile is something that makes fat. Big fat drops, smaller fat drops. So your liver is the only thing that's making bile, not your gallbladder. Your gallbladder is just going to hold on to extra bile. It's going to store it. It's like a little bile sac. <clears throat> so your liver makes bile. Bile's coming down here, and it's going to break the fat droplets. It's going to make them small enough so that you can, so that the enzyme can work on. And then, of course, like, like right now, maybe you haven't eaten breakfast yet, and you slept all night, and your body's still making bile. What are you gonna do with that bile? Because you don't need it. And you store it in, in the gall, you'll store it in the gallbladder. <clears throat> Do you hear people getting this thing taken out? Like maybe, probably your mother, if I had to choose one of your parents, your mother got it taken out. They, this duct right here probably, call this the cystic duct, it probably got clogged. And rather than, I mean, you could try to stick something up, but this is a long trip, right? You gotta get in here, and you gotta go in here, you gotta come up here, I don't even know how easy that is, right? You get a rupture or something? Yeah, it's easier to cut it out. And the doctor makes more money. So you just snip it off right here, take this thing out. You're still going to live. But what kind of food now do you have to be a little bit careful about? But anything heavy with grease? Anything heavy with grease. It's not that you cannot make bile, but. Yeah, actually, be careful with coffee, too. <laughs> really? Yeah, too much sugar. And you put uh, too much sugar in the fats and everything, the sugar, especially people who put like caramel and all that. Oh, yeah. It can actually stick to you. Not really. Yeah, some of you guys, if you guys ever want to go on a diet and, and save a bunch of money, then lay off of the daily lattes. Like, not, forget about lattes. Whatever, whatever some people are buying in Starbucks or whatever, like they. Well, they say uh, cold coffee is actually more, uh, a lot healthier than hot coffee. Really? Yep. So, like, if you go to McDonald's, instead of getting the hot caramel macchiato, you just get the caramel frappe. It's not also less in calories and sugar, but it's actually digested quicker than the rest. Some of these drinks have more than 500 calories in them. Yeah. And people are going in the morning and getting, obviously not most of us, right, but like, I, I know, know what you What do you think they love it? <laughs> people that have like 10 bucks a day or 14 bucks a day to blow on just coffee, they do it. They go in the morning before they go to work. It doesn't matter if they're going to be late, whatever. They're going to get their whatever frappuccino. And then they're going to come back for lunch. And if they don't get it for lunch, they'll get it after work. So that's two drinks a day. That's like 12, 14 bucks, whatever it costs. And it's uh, it's over a thousand calories. How many calories should we have in a day? 2,000. Someone like me, less. 1,600. Yeah, a diet is 1,200 calories. That's it. There's your. 1200 calories, you blew it with your two coffee beans. There's no more room for food. They're really high. The other thing that people do is smoothie cream. Those, those are high, high in sugar. High in sugar, high in fat. Every morning it helps actually digest the system. 
more line from the and finish, and it actually helps push everything out of the way that the system the field is The line is actually really good for that. Okay. But you know that's any little girl has her Instagram page where she's always leading school to the king. She's fine. She's 19, so just <laughs> hold on. That all catches up. I want to see a 40 year old with an Instagram page and yoga pants getting Smoothie King twice a day. Show me that account. Then I'll rethink. The small intestine absorbs. Look, I probably used all my time. <laughs> yeah, I, I used all. My eight minutes that I was going to talk about pertinent stuff, I wasted it talking about Starbucks and Smoothie King and little girls' Instagram accounts. That's so great that you do yoga at the Grand Canyon. Never been done. All right, we're going to continue this, so I'm going to stop recording. Does anyone, I know I was kind of all over the place. Let me give you some takeaway questions. I'm just going to kind of verbally say it. Um, number one, what is the function of the stomach? And what does it, how can, what is the function of the stomach? And, and what is it about the shape of the stomach, like right? its features that allow the stomach to do that? I'll ask the same question about the small intestine. We're not there yet. I haven't talked about it, but I'll say. What is, the small what is the function of the small intestine? And how is the small intestine adapted to perform that function? And like, what's so special about the small intestine that it's able to absorb? I haven't discussed that yet. I'll do that next time. That's two questions. Third question, um, I, need, I want you to know about the sphincters. I've only talked about two. Cardiac, what's the function of the cardiac sphincter? What's the function of the pylorus sphincter? And then here's a fourth question, which I didn't even talk about. I skipped right over it. What's the function of the epiglottis? And um, we'll talk about it on uh, next class. But here's the epiglottis. It, it stops the food from going down the tree. Your windpipe. It, 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 it blocks maybe right here. See how the epiglottis is here, and then here it's blocking the trachea. So you see the food has no choice but to go down the esophagus. So that's it. Um, so for now, if you haven't studied for quiz four, I would tell you kind of put this stuff that I talked about in the back of your head. Go look over. The two chapters, the, I don't um, No, I don't. Go look over the, um, the one lecture from last class on the four types of tissue. That's all that quiz four is on. One chapter. Yeah, I started talking about organ systems. Yeah. And then I talked about epithelial. But really, my questions are going to be about epithelial. Connective muscle. And so animal tissues, we, and what type of animal tissues? Yeah. So I want you to know, like, where where would you find epithelial tissue? Like, what's it do? What are the shapes? I'm not going to be big on spelling, but you know, what are the shapes? Um, and then connective tissue, I'd like you to. List for me some different types of connective tissue. We talked about like five, so I'll say maybe three or four or something like that. <clears throat> um, what is connective tissue? Like, how is connective tissue different from epithelial? Epithelial, the cells are right up on top of each other, dense. Connective tissue, the opposite, sparse. The cells are far away from each other. Country homes versus apartments. You know what? If you guys put country home versus apartments, I don't really care because that means you know what it means. I'd much rather see that type of stuff other than you trying to I'm talking about you, trying to pull stuff off of the internet during the test. Like I don't know you have your phone. I know exactly what the internet language sounds like. 
They're in my house. This is what I do for a living. So anyway, I, I know the words. I know what words you use, and I know what words you don't use. So um, stop using <laughs> scientific words. Anyway, um, connected muscle, three types of muscle. I want you to know the differences between them. And cardiac muscle, I want you to know how it's different from skeletal muscle or, or striated muscle. If you, if you notice here, you go under modules, I have put two videos on this core material. The lecture that I gave last Wednesday, and then this one called animal tissues, this covers everything. And it's it's 22 minutes, but it like you can see, like I'm I'm being I'm being interactive with it. Right? I'm giving you everything you need for the quiz. Like this video right here, if you know this 20 minute video, you know this 20 minute video, you know the quiz. It's that's it. I'll go get on in. Shut this after down. I get to my kids to settle down. If you know, okay, the, nervous, the, only, the only question I would ask you for nervous tissue is what are the parts of a neuron? That's probably it. Cell body, axon, and right. That's the only question for nervous tissue. So, really, you're talking about three tissues epithelial, muscle, and then. Nervous tissue, I already gave the only question I would ask. What are the what are the three parts of a neuron? Done. Alright, let me stop recording. Do you guys have any questions? Anyone?